All right, so what I want to do next is look at what if it's not a person? So what if it's not two people? Maybe there's something about people. When they do it, they just automatically match up. Oh my gosh, that was not good. Okay, I want to do this with some cards on a track. Grab a different part. That one's missing a wheel. So we're going to leave the bumpers on. I want to make sure. Which one is which? So this is pushing to the left. It should be negative. I'll put it in this cart. And you can kind of snap these into the cart. is going to extend out enough that it can uh, bump into the other cart and measure the interaction between the carts. Okay. So I can actually crash them together and their bumpers are going to hit. contact in the middle there. Alright, so the first test that we're going to do is just kind of hit them together head on. Both carts have the same mass. I'm going to do them kind of slowly, maybe a little harder, and we should see several interactions show up once I hit play. A little bit downhill there. That's okay. That shouldn't affect us too much. Positive 20. So it looks like one of these is not quite properly zero, but that's okay. We can ignore that. So let me just do that again. And what we should see is each peak, it's a really quick interaction now, so it goes to a spike and comes back down to zero quite quick, quickly. But we should see that the spikes are equal. Okay? 
which might be expected. If I'm kind of crashing them together at the same speed, um, we might not expect either one to be a bigger force. So what we're going to do next is add a decent amount of mass in the back here to the cart. Add quite a bit of mass, actually. I think I can squeeze that in. Mm, yeah, perfect. So now, without actually hitting collect, watch what happens when they collide. The lighter cart goes flying. The heavier cart, the more massive cart, does not. And we're asking the same question, which one exerts a larger force, the heavy cart, the light cart, or maybe it's the same. And knowing that it's gonna do something like that, I want you to make your prediction. There we go, kept the clock a couple collisions. And as long as I get good contact between the bumpers, even though the lightweight cart goes flying, it's the same force. Okay, so for your, you know, your chart, as long as you have some peaks that look the same, if they don't hit quite head on, sometimes you can get a slightly different measurement. And then one last thing, let's see if we can confirm the same thing that we're seeing. What if I don't even move them together? I just let the um, one cart be at rest, and I hit the other one into it. I want to see that a couple of times and see how that compares in the amount of force. Looks pretty similar to me. Do a little slower, a little faster. The trend continues, right? So. The whole point of this series of demonstrations is to say, I can try to do all sorts of different things between the interacting force sensors. No matter what you try, if they're in good contact and they're pointing right at each other, either a push or a pull, the force is going to be the same. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is it's simultaneous, right? These two peaks go up and go back down at the exact same instant. So I'm going to ask you guys, is there anything else I should try to try to make the two four sensors different? Can you think of anything that you want me to you know, set up and do with the cards that we haven't already seen, just to double check that they're the same? One chance. OK, so it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> we could do it all sorts of different things. And we will always see that as long as the four sensors are pushing right against each other, that the, um, the amount of force they exert on one another is exactly the same and instantaneous, simultaneous to one another. Okay, so in the lab document that you guys have, I had a third page that I didn't print that kind of summarizes our results. So you might have recognized this result. What it's telling us is actually what's um, kind of summarized by Newton's third law of motion. So Newton's first law of motion was the law of inertia. We talked about how sometimes you learn those and you memorize them or they come to mind, but they're not really precise enough. So the law of inertia was the one that says objects, objects in motion tend to stay in motion, objects at rest tend to stay at rest. And we said that's really not enough to fully explain Newton's first law. Newton's first law is an object will maintain its motion, it will have constant velocity as long as there is no unbalanced force on the object. So unbalanced forces cause acceleration, the lack of an unbalanced force causes constant velocity motion. So Newton's third law, most people know it as something like uh, for every action force there's an equal and opposite reaction force, or even worse, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Sometimes it doesn't even mention the idea of force. Okay. What we saw here, and stating it unambiguously better, is to say that forces always come in pairs. So forces are always between two things. 
they are equal in magnitude, which is size, and opposite in direction. Okay. So let me say that again. Forces always come in pairs, equal in magnitude, opposite in direction. That clears up any ambiguity with Newton's third law. Okay. So I don't like to use action and reaction because action and reaction kind of implies something happens first and then something happens second. That's not it at all, it's simultaneous. The two force pairs are simultaneous, equal in size, opposite in direction. So sometimes you can summarize Newton's third law by saying the force of object one on two is equal to negative force of two on one. The negative is just playing the opposite direction. Okay, we've got about five minutes. We'll, we'll wrap things up here. Examples of Newton's third law. You push it on a wall, it pushes back with you. Newton's third law can be used to explain um, normal force, right? I push on the table, the table gets compressed and pushes back on me with the exact same amount of force. Swimmer pushes backwards on water molecules. So what propels the swimmer forward is actually those water molecules pushing them forward. You want to swim faster, either with your feet or your uh, legs, you want to push harder on the water molecules so that the water molecules, molecules will press harder on you and propel you forward. A car moving. People don't think about it like this. But in order for a car to move and accelerate, the tires have to spin and push backwards on the road so that the road pushes forward on the tires and propels the car forward. If you don't have any friction, if it's slippery, you can't get the car going because you're not able to push the road and the road can't push back. The fourth one's a little bit confusing. So the earth pulls downward on a falling object like a ball dropping, that ball is actually pulling up on the earth with the same amount of force, okay? They don't meet in the middle though because the earth has a huge amount of inertia. So the amount of force that clearly accelerates a ball downward is not gonna have a noticeable effect on the acceleration of the earth, right? Um, you'd have to have something earth mass size to see the earth actually be accelerated in any measurable way. So just a final point, it's important to remember that the demonstration shows that the forces mentioned above are equal in magnitude and simultaneous, okay? So if you go back to the evaluation statements on the front, they are all equal, okay? The small compact car does actually push back on the van with the same amount of force. The small compact car might go flying because it has less inertia, it's going to experience a greater acceleration, but the force is the same. If I push on a door, it's pushing back on me with the same amount of force. It can't help but do that. That's just how the universe works. Newton's third law explains that. And again, the earth pulling the ball downward is actually equal to the ball pulling the earth upward. The earth doesn't undergo a big acceleration because it's massive, it's huge, right? It would need a huge amount of force to accelerate. All right, so for next time. I do want you to finish up more practice with force diagrams for Monday. Also, I scanned the textbook section on Newton's Third Law, textbook section 4.5. Make sure you access that and read it. It's a pretty short section. And that will get us through to Monday. Monday, our first order of business will be to explain more practice with force diagrams. So do your best to go through those. Again, it's just 12 examples of different force diagrams for different objects experiencing different types of things. All right, we're going to stop the video here.